Hey everybody, it's Dr. Cody Rawl. Welcome to Tech for Psych. You might recognize these devices as Halo Sport, Dream 2, and Think. We're gonna take a look behind the scenes on what happened to these companies and offer some insight towards where the industry of wearable brand computer interface devices is going as a result. This video, we're gonna take a look at devices that did not make my devices for 2022 video. And that reason is because these devices are no longer available to the general consumer. Wow. Why is that? People really enjoy these devices. Why did they go off the market? Well, I've got some inside sources and I've talked to some people. It helps to be a YouTube guy sometimes because it gives you connections that you can figure out what happened behind the scenes. But they're really curious and interesting stories behind these devices and while they're no longer available and gives us an idea of what's going on in the niche overall. The medical device space is a weird one because you have this big regulatory body called the Federal Drug Administration or the FDA keeping control about what is offered to the general public. Now, this is an important thing. You don't want products out there that could be hurting people or making claims that they can't live up to. On one hand, you have the medical device treatment category. These can make specific claims. You can have a device and say that, hey, this will specifically treat your ADHD. Hey, this will specifically treat paralysis from stroke. This medication is approved for treating diabetes. If you are going to make claims about treating a specific disease with a medication or product, that needs to be approved by the FDA to be marketed to the American people. What's more is that we are living within this medical insurance realm era where medical treatments are very expensive without medical insurance. So if you can get a device or a medication approved by insurance, the insurance companies will pick up the bill, meaning that much more people will engage in the treatment and both the patient and the insurance company will help cover the bill, meaning that you can charge a lot more for the service. The reason why I bring all this up is that a lot of these devices right now are in the health and wellness category. They can be marketed as promoting health and wellness, but they cannot be marketed as specifically treating a disease. And since the only entity that's actually paying for the product is the person themselves, the consumer, the consumer is only going to be willing to spend a certain amount of money. Think of it as like $300 for buying a device versus several thousand dollars for another medical device that's helped to be covered with insurance. This puts companies in a weird position. Do they either stick with the health and wellness category and go for the general consumer, or do they attempt to get regulatory approval so they can charge much more and get some of that sweet insurance money that that is part of the American ecosystem or the ecosystem of other countries as well. Now here's where things get interesting. How much new cutting edge technology can you really fit into a $300 wearable? I talked to Chris Aamoni from Muse and he had a really interesting point. And so, you know, we have a lot of contacts in the industry and we have people who do come to us, you know, when they have something new. Um, you know, but it's, but it's one thing to have something that's working on the lab bench and it's another thing to have something which is truly ready for you know, a low cost consumer device, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's, that's always a big, big step. Um, so you need to be producing enough volume and the processes have to be mature enough that you, know, you can actually do this in a low cost way. Um, I mean, I think people really value being able to afford the device and, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, if you, if you look at the kind of research and medical counterparts of this technology, this, this stuff is really, really expensive. And it's, you know, part of the reason why is you're not, you're not getting the economy of scale in it. And you need to be able to figure out how to, to work with really low cost parts um, in order to be able to, to produce something that's actually affordable. So it's, there are so many markups, you know, that, that go from the cost of the actual, like the sand you're putting into it to the thing that you actually buy. Uh, and so I think I mean, most consumers are pretty shocked at like how li you know, little the device at, in its raw form can cost in order to be able to buy it in a store for X number of dollars. Uh, so it's, you know, as someone who kind of like tries to build consumer tech, it's just like, really? Like, this is, this is how much we have to work within? Like, oh my God, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it is very difficult to stick a lot of cutting edge technology into these wearable devices. Meaning that if you get a device like Muse for $300, if you get a device like Mendy that has cutting edge FNIR's technology for three to $400, that says a lot. That product needs to go through a lot of development, a lot of approval steps, uh, at scale manufacturing and marketing 
all to get into your hand. It's amazing if any of these companies actually make a profit at this point before mainstream adoption of these neurowearable technologies. And that truly seems to be the struggle. If you are trying to get into mainstream with these weird devices that you wear on your head, how far can you get going in an uphill battle before you decide, hey, maybe we should go for FDA approval for a full on medical device where insurance companies will help cover the bill, especially if you've got a device and product that really works. Let's start with the Dream 2. I think this is a perfect example. When I saw this thing, I immediately thought, wow, this device really can replace sleep testing. Instead of going to a clinic and getting hooked up with a bunch of wires and being expected to sleep in a weird foreign environment and getting data from that, you can take the Dream 2 home, wear it in your own bed, and get data that rivals polysomography data that's done in the clinic. They're able to show that with clinical studies. That's why I was so excited about the Dream 2. But the Dream 2 is no longer available to the general public. Why is that? Why did they stop selling to the general consumer? First off, I'll just cut to the chase and say that they are working with big tech and big pharma now in order to create exactly what this thing would be most valuable doing, which is replacing polysomography machines. And they can get FDA approval for a device like this. They can get insurance companies to pay for a device like this. Maybe instead of manufacturing at a very large scale and selling for a relatively low price to the consumers, you and I, it's more profitable to go the FDA route and get insurance companies to pick up the bill on this. Because if this is collecting gold standard polysomography data, the FDA should approve this and insurance companies should cover the bill. And that seems exactly what has happened. The company has decided, hey, why are we going up this uphill battle selling directly to consumer when it looks like the other route might be a lot easier for mainstream penetrants if insurance companies pick up the bill. In addition, they'll have more resources to make this device even better at picking up data because they'll be able to jam more cutting edge technology into it for a higher price. Something similar, but a little bit different seems to have happened with the Halo Neuroscience headband. If you recall, this is the headband that has the nibs that delivered direct electrical stimulation to the motor cortex to enhance athletic performance. They boasted a 31% increase in the vertical jump of the Olympic ski team, for example. There was a lot of advertisements and everybody was very excited about the Halo Neuroscience headband. I still think it's a very cool device. I was able to interview one of the founders, Dr. Daniel Chow in San Francisco, which was really fun. And from what I've heard, it was difficult to educate the general public on how to use this device properly. It's like you have to wet the nibs, you have to put it on, you have to stimulate your motor cortex before for the physical activity. It seemed to be a lot better tailored towards coaches and clinics that would use it rather than the individual consumer. Now I know the company was talking to the FDA and debating on going more the medical route for uh, direct electrical stimulation of stroke patients, but what ended up happening to everybody's surprise is they were bought by Flow Neuroscience. Now Flow Neuroscience is developing direct electrical stimulation for the treatment of depression. And I know Halo Neuroscience is looking into that field as well. Which yeah. brings us to talking about, you know, you guys have focused on the motor strip, but there's so much more that you could do with this technology 100%. yeah 100 percent. so there's um we've been talking about the motor strip but there's been some wonderful research done in other parts of the brain mm -hmm. um, in particular the prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. um, has been an area of focus with i would say like re really like leading psychiatrists and cognitive neuroscientists coming together and stimulating that part of the brain to generate some really interesting data um, so uh, on the disease side, mm -hmm. targeting the prefrontal cortex has been shown to be a potential drug alternative for depression. Yeah. So there are now at least two very well, well done RCTs that show that um, non-invasive brain stimulation of prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. works as well as an SSRI That's amazing. for frontline treatment of depression. So wouldn't that be awesome if we yeah. had you know, I'm not saying let's get rid of drugs and the SSRI class of drugs altogether, but wouldn't it be nice to have an alternative? With everything going on in the world, the mental health pandemic is really raging and people are looking for solutions and treatment of mental health disorders like depression, anxiety, ADHD, etc. And so it's really interesting that Flow Neuroscience bought their business operations patents and everything else that goes with the business. So 
we could see a resurgence of the halo neuroscience technology in flow neuroscience for more of a mental health treatment plan. But as of now, you can't even buy the headset from the website anymore, and that same goes for Dream. Both of them are off the market. The third device that I'll talk about is Think. For those of you that remember this, it uh, goes on an electric sticky pad that goes on your forehead like this, and you can choose either Calm or Alert. I know they were running into difficulties with the patches. It was like you had to get a subscription for the patches. People were upset that you couldn't just buy the device, and it would be good for the lifetime of its use. They tried to get a subscription service for the patches, but that didn't seem to be working well. Wikipedia says that they exited the consumer health market in 2017 to focus on a potential treatment for psoriasis. Apparently direct electrical stimulation on the skin can help with that. But coincidentally, literally when I was making the final edits of this video, I was contacted by the company again out of the blue. So apparently the company is still alive and they want me to try their new product called the Feelzing Energy Patch. After talking with them, it sounds like the previous form factor of a pod was too difficult to use with their customer base. So they are rebranding into this easier to use patch that still uses direct electrical stimulation for energy and focus. I'll be getting those patches soon, so stay tuned for a review of those on my channel in the near future. So what can we learn from these three devices? Well, there seems to be three different exit strategies for the companies. One of them has gone more of a biomedical route. Another has been bought by another neuro wearable company. And another had to go underground for a few years to rethink its strategy and then give things another try with a new form factor and rebranding. I think what we can learn from these companies is that all these devices that I've been talking about on this channel, um, they're not always gonna be around, obviously. I mean, either the company is gonna iterate and phase them out, or the companies will not even be around anymore because they decided to pivot into a different business area, get bought up by other wearable companies, or even go the biomedical route. So what I'm saying is that if you enjoy a device, get involved in the community, join with others, talk on these discussion boards, give the companies your feedback because they're really relying on us, the consumer, to keep these businesses alive. Maybe you're not as invested in this area as I am, but I think it's a good reason to take ownership of the niche. If you really enjoy brain training and getting the data, learning from it, be a leader, be a leader in your own community, start meditation groups, uh, give presentations at your school, start using the technology in your workplace. Uh, these companies need us to be the cheerleaders for this new evolution that's happening, which is incorporating the neural wearables into our everyday lives. Only then will we be able to see companies evolve, you know, and I want to see companies like on the low end of FNIR's Mendy and on the higher end of FNIR's uh, Kernel and Open Water to be able to collaborate uh, or at least develop new technologies that allow the whole field to move forward to where we have devices that are incredibly powerful. They need our help with guidance, feedback, to form discussion groups, and help them uh, develop technology right along with them. I mean, we're early adopters, which is an exciting period to be in. I mean, imagine when computers first came along and there was people like us talking about computers when no one else was and uh, just geeking out about what was possible about the future and those early uh, computer companies really relied on the public to give them feedback to, for early adopters to help sustain the ecosystems to move forward. And that's what I really see us doing with brain computer interface technologies. And uh, you know, there's a real risk for these companies and for us as consumers for them to pivot to the medical route and rely on insurance companies to make payments for the actual technology rather than making it readily available to us so that we can buy them off the internet and uh, you know have the brain wearables at home for us to learn about our own brains and democratize that technology. So if you're passionate about these devices, I really appreciate it. I ask you to subscribe to this channel and give feedback to the companies. If you wanna make a purchase, take a look at the video that I just put up last week about uh, my top choices for 2022. Thanks so much for listening. This is Dr. Cody Rall with Tech vs. Psych. Talk to you next time soon. What do you guys think I should do with these, by the way? I mean, I guess I'll hold on to them. Maybe I'll make a neurotechnology uh, museum one day in 20 years after my entire house is filled with these products.